Chapter 19 of Fern's Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fern's Hollow by Hesba Stretton. Chapter 19 Fire, Fire. Anne was standing close to the pantry door, listening to Stephen's mysterious movements in utter bewilderment, hardly knowing whether she ought to call her uncle, but not coming to a decision about it until the boy appeared before her. His first quick action was to secure the door by fastening a rusty bolt which was on the outside, and then, in a few hurried sentences, he explained his strange conduct by telling her how tim had conveyed to him the design of some of the colliers for breaking into the master's house there had been several similar robberies in the country during the strike for wages and miss anne was greatly alarmed while stephen felt all the tender spirit of a brave man aroused within him as she sank faint and trembling upon the nearest seat don't be afraid he said courageously they shall tear me to pieces before they touch you miss anne i'm stronger than you'd think but if i can't take care of thee god can hasn't he sent me here afore they come on purpose they'd have come upon you unawares but for god you are right stephen answered miss anne he says thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night but what shall we do how can we make ourselves safer i'll try not to be afraid but we must do all we can ourselves hark there's a footstep already yes there was a footstep and not a very stealthy one approaching the house and the dog bounded forward to the full length of his chain but he was beaten down with a blow that stunned him the men were too strong in numbers and too secure in the extreme loneliness of the dwelling to care about taking many precautions miss anne and stephen heard mr wiley cross the floor of his room above and open his window but there was silence again and the chime of the house clock striking eleven was the only sound that broke the silence until the casement above was reclosed and the master's footfall returned across the room i must go and tell him said miss anne perhaps he can secure some of his money lest martha should be stopped on the way or not come in time stay here and watch stephen and let me know if you hear anything she stole upstairs in the dark lest those without should see the glimmer of her candle through the fan light in the hall and then she spoke softly to her uncle through his locked and bolted door downstairs stephen listened with his quickened hearing to the footsteps gathering around the house and presently the latch of the pantry door was lifted with a sudden click that made him start and catch his breath but jack davies could come no further now that the rusty bolt was drawn on the outside there was a whispered conversation through the pantry window and the sound of some one getting out again and then stephen crept across the dark kitchen into the hall through which miss anne had gone at the head of the staircase was the door of the master's room now standing open and the light from it served to guide him across the strange hall and up the stairs until he reached the doorway and could look in the chamber had a low and sloping ceiling and a gable window in the roof which was defended by strong bars near this window was an open cabinet containing many little drawers and divisions all of which were filled with papers while upon a leaf in the front there lay rolls of banknotes and heaps of golden money which the master had been counting over he stood beside his cabinet as if he had just risen from this occupation and was leaning upon his chair panic-stricken at the tidings miss anne had uttered his gray hair was scattered over his forehead instead of being smoothly brushed back and the long loose coat which hung carelessly around his shriveled form and stooping shoulders made him look far older than he did in the daytime as stephen's eyes rested upon the sunken form and quaking limbs of the aged man he felt for the first time how helpless and infirm his enemy was instead of the rich full and prospering master he had always considered him keep off cried the old miser as he caught sight of stephen on the threshold and raised his withered arm as if to ward him from his treasures 
keep off stephen fern is that you you've come to take your revenge the robbers and murderers have got in oh god have pity upon me i've come to take care of miss anne said stephen they've not got in yet master and please god help will be here afore long with martha the doors and windows are safe anne take him away implored mr wiley i don't know if it's true but take him away i'm not safe while he's there they will murder me go go miss anne led stephen away and no sooner were they outside the room than the master rushed forward and locked and barred the door securely behind them there was a window in the landing looking over the yard where the housebreakers were and they stood at it in silence straining their eyes into the darkness but it did not remain dark long for a thin bright flame burst up from behind the dairy wall and by its fitful blaze they could see the figures of four men coming rapidly round from that corner of the old building fire fire they shouted in wild voices of alarm and beating the iron-studded door with heavy sticks wake up master wake up the house is on fire their only answer was a frantic scream from the servant who thrust her head out of her window and echoed their shouts with piercing cries but stephen and miss anne did not move only miss anne laid her hand upon his arm and he felt how much she trembled they're only trying to frighten us he said quietly that's only the woodstack on fire they think to frighten us to open the door by making believe the house is on fire miss anne i'm praying to god all the while to send martha in time so am i she answered sobbing but oh stephen i'm frightened miss anne he said in a comforting tone that chapter about faith you've been teaching me it says something about quenching fire quenched the violence of fire she murmured out of weakness we're made strong she hid her face for a minute or two in both her hands and then she was strong enough to go to the servant's room where the terrified girl was still calling for help the wild shouts and the deafening clamour at the door rang through the house but the blaze was gone down again and when stephen threw open the window just over the heads of the group of men in the yard below there was not light enough for him to distinguish their faces i'm here he said stephen fern i found out what you're up to and martha's gone to longville for help she'll be here for long and you can't force the door open put out the fire in the woodstack and go home maybe if you're not found here you'll get off for i've seen none of you and i can only guess at who you are go home i say there was a low deep growl of disappointment and a hurried consultation among the men but whether they would follow stephen's counsel it was not permitted them to choose for suddenly a strong bright flame burst up in a high column like a beacon into the midnight air and every one gazing upwards saw in a moment that the thatch over the farthest gable had caught fire the house itself was now burning and the light blazing full upon their upturned faces revealed to stephen the well-known features of four of his former comrades the shout that rang from their lips was one of real alarm now stephen lad open the door cried black thompson we thought to smoke the old fox out of his kennel but it took fire in earnest we'll not hurt him nor miss anne lad the old house will burn like tinder what a glaring light spread through the landing the face of miss anne coming round the servants room shone rosy and bright in it though she was pale with fear through the open window drifted a suffocating smoke of burning wood and thatch and the crackling and splitting of the old roof sounded noisily above their voices but miss anne commanded herself and spoke calmly to stephen we must open the door to them now she said god will protect us from these wicked men uncle uncle the house is really on fire and we want the keys let me in she knocked loudly at his door and lifted up her voice to make him hear and stephen shouted but there was no answer without the keys of the massive locks it would not be possible to open the doors and he had them in his own keeping but he gave no heed to their calls nor the vehement screams of the frightened servant perhaps he had fallen into a fit 
and they had no means of entering his chamber so securely had he fastened himself in with his gold stephen and miss anne gazed at one another in the dazzling and ominous light but no words crossed their trembling lips oh the horror of their position and already other voices were mingled with those of the assailants and every one was shouting from without praying them to open the door and be saved from their tremendous peril i'll not open the door said mr wiley from within they'll rob and murder me they are come to kill me and i may as well die here there's no help there is help dear uncle cried miss anne there are other people from botfield and help is coming from longville oh let me in no said the master they all hate me they'll kill me and say it was done in the fire i'll not open to anybody she prayed and expostulated in vain he cared little for their danger so hardened was he by a selfish fear for himself the fire was gaining ground quickly for a brisk wind had sprung up and the long seasoned timber in the old walls burned like touchwood the servant lay insensible on the threshold of the master's chamber and miss anne and stephen looked out from a front casement upon the gathering crowd who implored them with frenzied earnestness to throw open the door miss anne cried stephen you can get through the pantry window you are little enough oh be quick and let me see you safe i cannot she answered not yet not till the last moment i dare not leave my uncle and that poor girl oh stephen if martha would but come she rested her head against the casement sobbing as though her grief could not be assuaged stephen felt heartsick with his intense longing for the arrival of help from longville as he watched the progress of the fire but at last after what appeared ages of waiting they heard a shout in the distance and saw a little band of horsemen galloping up to the burning house they are come from longville uncle cried miss anne you must open now there is not a moment to spare the fire is gaining upon us fast he had seen their approach himself and now he opened the doors and gave the keys to miss anne he had collected all his papers and notes in one large bundle which he had clasped in his arms and as soon as the crowd swept in through the open doors he cried aloud to the constable from longville to come and guard him there was very little time for saving anything out of the house for before long the flames gathered such volume and strength as to drive every one out before them and as stephen stood beside the miserable old man who was shivering in the bitter night wind he beheld his dwelling destroyed as suddenly and entirely as the hut at fern's hollow had been end of chapter 19chapter twenty of fern's hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fern's hollow by hesba stretton chapter twenty stephen's testimony Mr. Wiley would not stir from the place where he could gaze upon his old home burning to the ground. He stood rooted to the spot, like one fascinated and enchained by a power he could not resist. Grasping his precious bundle to his breast, and clinging firmly to the arm of the Longville doctor, who had been one of those who hastened to his rescue. Now and then he broke out into a deep cry, which he did not seem to hear himself but even the gray dawn of the morning brightening over the rounded outlines of the mountains did not awaken him from his trance of terror and bewilderment miss anne kept near to him all night and stephen lingered about her making a seat for her upon the grass and taking care that martha also should be at hand to wait upon her there was a great buzzing of people about them hurrying to and fro and every now and then they heard different conjectures as to how the fire began but it was not generally known that the constables from longville and botfield had contrived to arrest black thompson and davies in the midst of the confusion 
and had quietly taken them off to the jail at Longville. When the daylight grew strong, it shone upon a smouldering mass of ruins and heaps of broken furniture piled upon the downtrodden grass. The master had grown aged in that one night, and he gazed helplessly about him as if for someone to direct and guide him. He no longer refused to quit the place, only he would not trust himself anywhere near Botfield, and as soon as a carriage could be procured, he and Miss Anne were driven off to Longville. There was nothing more to wait for now, and Stephen went quietly home to breakfast in the Center Hill cabin. It was a good deal later than usual that morning, when the engineman at the works sent down the first skip-load of colliers into the pit. Four of their number were absent, but that excited no surprise after the events of the night, and even Bess Thompson supposed her father had gone off to the public-house with the others. But what was the amazement of the colliers when they found Tim at the bottom of the shaft, fiercely hungry after his night's fasting, and as fiercely anxious to hear what had been taking place overhead? he had the prudence however to listen to their revelations without making any of his own and would not even explain how he came to be left behind in the pit he went up in the ascending skip and escaping from the curiosity of the people on the bank he darted as straight as an arrow to stephen's cabin i'm nigh clemmed were his first words as he seized the brown loaf and cut off a slice which he devoured ravenously it seems like a year he continued thee'll never catch me being left behind anywhere again eh stephen lad many a time i shouted for fear i'd never see daylight again it's awful down there in the night thee hears them as thee can't see punning again the coal and then there comes a downfall like a clap of thunder i wasn't so much afeard of little nan she never did any harm when she was alive and i thought god was too good to send her out of heaven just to terrify a poor lad like me but how did thee get left behind asked martha then tim told them how the horse doctor had gone down to secure one of the ponies in a large strong net in order to bring it to the surface of the earth for a time and that he had gone down with him more for his own amusement than to help him he had wandered a little way into the winding galleries of the pit and came back just as the skip was going up for the last time but one thompson and davies were deep in conversation with the men who remained and stealing behind them he overheard their plot and their intention of persuading stephen to join them after that he dare not for his very life come forward when the skip descended and he watched them go up leaving him alone for the night in that dismal place he had his father's lamp with him and so made his way to the bottom of the old shaft and waited with what impatience and anxiety we may imagine to hear stephen return from his work it was awfully lonesome he said and i thought stephen would never come or i'd never make him hear it wasn't much better after he had come only for thinking miss anne would be safe my lamp went out and i reckon i said our father over a hundred times besides i was wondering what was being done overhead i'll never be left behind anywhere again i can tell ye well said stephen my sheep and lambs don't know about the fire and i must be off they'll want me just as bad as if i'd been in bed all night still he could not help turning aside with tim just for another glimpse of the smouldering ruins looking so black and desolate in the daylight but after that he did not loiter a minute and spent the rest of the morning in diligent attention to his duties until a little before midday he saw the farmer who employed him riding across the sheep walk and when he ran forward to receive his orders he bade him make haste and go home to prepare himself for appearing before the magistrate to give his evidence against black thompson and his comrades when stephen reached the cinder hill cabin he found tim there again and bess thompson waiting to see him poor bess had been crying bitterly for by this time it was known that her father and davies were in jail though the others being young and single men had fled at once from the place and escaped for the present as soon as stephen entered 
Bess threw herself on her knees at his feet and looked up imploringly into his face. Oh, dear good Stephen, she cried, thee canst save father. I'll kneel here till thee has promised to save him. Oh, don't bear any spite again him, but forgive him and save him. Get up, Bess, said Stephen kindly. Don't thee kneel down to a fellow like me. I'll do anything for thy father. I've no spite again him. Oh, I knew thee would, she said. Thee'll tell the justice thee never saw him till the other folks came up from Botfield. Tim says he didn't see anybody down in the pit, and he's promised not to swear to their names. Don't thee swear to seeing anybody. But I did see every one of them, Stephen answered. And Tim knew all their voices, and there'll be lots to tell who came up in the last skip. There's nobody in Botfield will swear again them, pleaded Bess. Whose place is it to know who came up in the last skip, or who was at the fire last night? Oh, Stephen, the Bible says we're to do good to them that hate us. And if fathers hated thee, thee canst save him now. Aye, said Tim. Bess is right. There's not a mother's son in Botfield to swear again them for the master's sake. If he didn't see them, nor Miss Anne, why need we know? I'll soon baffle the justice, I promise ye. It's a rare chance to forgive Black Thompson, anyhow. Bess and Tim, answered Stephen in great distress. I can't do it. It isn't that I bear a grudge against thy father. I've almost forgotten that he ever did anything to me. But it's not true. It's sure to come out somehow. Why, I don't even know what I said to Miss Anne last night. But if I hadn't told a word to anybody, I'd be bound to tell the truth now. Only say thee are uncertain, urged Bess. Nay, lass, said Stephen. I am certain. I'd do anything that was right for thy sake and to save thy father. But I can't do this, and it would be no use if I could. God seeth in secret, and he will reward men openly. He's begun to reward the master already. We can do nothing for thy father, but every one of us to tell the truth and pray to God for him. Father was good to thee when thou wert ill, said Bess. Aye, I know it, he replied. But if he was my own father, I could not tell a lie to get him off. I'd do anything I could. Oh, Bess and Tim, don't ask me to go again the right. It'll break mother's heart, said Bess, bursting out into a loud crying. We made sure of thee, because thee says so much about having thy enemies, and we were only afeard of Tim. Thee says we are to do to another as we'd have them do to us. If thee was in father's place, thee'd want him to do as I ask thee. Thee doesn't think father wants thee to swear again him. Nay, answered Stephen, the justice and Miss Anne would have me tell the truth. It seems as if I can't do to everybody as they'd like me, so I'll abide by telling the truth. There was no time for further discussion, for the constable from Longville came in to conduct them before the magistrate to give their separate evidence concerning the events of the past night. Bess went with them, weeping all the way beside them and grieving Stephen's heart by her tears, though she dared not speak a word in the constable's presence. But he gave his testimony gravely and truthfully, and Tim and Martha followed his example, and in consequence of their joint evidence, Black Thompson and Davies were fully committed to take their trial at the next Assizes, and were removed that afternoon to the county jail. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of Fern's Hollow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fern's Hollow by Hesba Stretton Chapter 21 Forgiveness. Bess Thompson started off on her way to her desolate home, almost heartbroken, and with such a wrathful resentment against Stephen, 
and martha and tim has seemed to blot out all memory of the lessons she had been learning from miss anne since the little child's death she could never bear to go near them or speak to them again since they had sworn against her father and had not he been good to them when stephen was ill often sparing her to watch with martha as well as helping to make up his wages if this was their religion she did not care to have it for nobody else in botfield would have done the same and now she might as well give up all thoughts of getting to heaven where little nan and her baby sister were for there would be nobody to care for her and she would be obliged to go back to all her old ways these were her bitter thoughts as she walked homewards alone for stephen was gone up to the doctor's house to inquire after the master and miss anne and the others were waiting for him in longville she heard their voices after a while coming along the turnpike road and walking quickly as if to overtake her so she turned aside into a field and hid herself under a hedge that they might pass by she crouched down low upon the grass and covered her red and smarting eyes from the sunshine with her shawl and then she listened for their footsteps to die away in the distance but she felt an arm stealing round her and martha's voice whispered close in her ear bess dear bess thee must not hide thyself from us we love thee bess and we are sore sorry for thee stephen is ever so downhearted about thee and thy father oh bess thee must have no spite at us bess said stephen thy father owned i was telling the truth and said he forgave me for speaking again him and he shook hands with me afore he went and he said stephen thee be a friend to my poor lass and i gave him a sure promise that i would nobody'll ever look at me now cried bess nobody'll be friends with me if father's transported we're thy friends answered stephen and thee has a father in heaven that cares for thee listen bess it will do thee good and poor old grandfather no harm now he was transported beyond the seas once and no one casts it up to him now nor to us and haven't we got friends cheer up bess miss anne says maybe this very trouble will bring thy father to repentance he said he'd repent some time and maybe this will be the very time for him and miss anne sends her kind love to thee and thy mother and she'll come and see thy mother as soon as she can leave the master thus comforted poor sorrowful bess rose from the ground and walked on with them to botfield most of the house doors were open and the women were standing at them in order to waylay them with inquisitive questions but stephen's grave and steady face and the presence of bess who walked close beside him as if there was shelter and protection there kept them silent and they were compelled to satisfy their curiosity with second-hand reports martha went on with bess to her own cottage to stay all night with her and help her to console her broken-hearted mother though martha was truly sorry for black thompson's family she felt her importance as one of the chief witnesses against him especially as the cinder hill cabin was visited not only by the gossips of botfield but by more distinguished persons from all the farmhouses around and her thrilling narrative of her hazardous journey through botfield along the high road was listened to with greedy interest in this foolish talking she lost that true sympathy which she ought to have felt for poor bess and forfeited the blessing which would have been given to her own soul but it was very different with stephen in his lonely work upon the mountains there he thought over the crimes and punishment of black thompson until his heart was filled with an unutterable pity and fellow-feeling both towards him and his family and every night as he went home from his labour he turned aside to the cottage to read to bess and her mother some portion of the scriptures which he had chosen for their comfort out of a pocket bible given to him by miss anne about a fortnight after these events stephen received a visitor upon the uplands where he was seeking a lamb that had strayed into a dwarf forest of gorse bushes 
and was bleating piteously in its bewilderment a pleasant sounding voice called stephen fern and when he got free from the entangling thorns with the rescued lamb in his arms who should be waiting for him but the lord of the manor himself stephen knew his face again in an instant and dropped the lamb that he might take off his old cap while the gentleman smiled at him with a hearty smile i am danesford of danesford he said gaily and i believe you are stephen fern of fern's hollow i've brought you a message my boy can you guess what young lady has sent me over the hills after you miss anne answered stephen promptly no there are other young ladies in the world beside miss anne replied mr danesford have you forgotten miss lockwood she has not forgotten you and we are come home ready to give battle to your enemies and reinstate you in all your rights she gives mr lockwood and me no rest until we've got ferns hollow and everything else for you again sir said stephen and his eyes filled with tears nobody can give me back little nan no answered mr danesford gravely i know how hardly you've been dealt with my boy tell me truly is your religion strong enough to enable you to forgive mr wiley indeed is it possible that you can forgive him from your heart stephen was silent looking down at the heath upon which his feet were pressed but seeing none of its purple blossoms it was a question that must not be answered rashly for even that morning he had glanced down the fatal shaft with a deep yearning after little nan and as he passed the ruins of his master's house his memory had recalled the destruction of the old hut with something of a feeling of triumph sir he said looking up to him i'm afraid i can't explain myself you know it was for my sake that the lord jesus was killed yet his father has forgiven me all my sins and when i think of that i can forgive the master even for little nan's death with all my heart but i don't always remember it and then i feel a little glad at the fire i haven't got much religion yet i don't know everything that's in the bible yet i could learn some lessons from you stephen said mr danesford after a pause what do you suppose i should do if anybody tried to take danesford hall from me i don't know sir answered stephen nor do i he said smiling at any rate they should not have it with my consent nor shall anybody take ferns hollow from you i have been down to longville about it but mr wiley is too ill to see me by the way i told miss anne i was coming up the hills after you she wants to see you stephen as soon as possible after your work is done mr danesford rode on over the hills and stephen walked some way beside him to put him into the nearest path for danesford after he was gone he watched earnestly for the evening shadows and when they stretched far away across the plains he hastened down to the cabin and then on to longville to his appointed interview with miss anne End of chapter 21chapter 22 of ferns hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org ferns hollow by hesba stretton chapter 22 the master's deathbed when the master at last consented to leave the site of his old dwelling burning into blackened heaps he seemed to care nothing where he might be taken he was without a home and almost without a friend it was not accident merely but the long provoked hatred of his people that had driven him from the old chambers and the old roof which had sheltered him for so many years and where all the habits and memories of his life centred miss anne had not been long enough at botfield to form friendships on her own account except among the poor and ignorant people on her uncle's works 
and she accepted most thankfully the offer of the doctor from longville to give them a refuge in his house no sooner had they arrived there than it was discovered that the master was struck with paralysis brought on by the shock of the fire and all the terrifying circumstances attending it he was carried at once to a bedroom and from that time miss anne had been fully occupied in nursing him he had seemed to be getting better the last day or two and his power of speech had returned though he spoke but rarely only following miss anne's movements with earnest eyes and hardly suffering her to leave him even for necessary rest and refreshment all that afternoon he had been tossing his restless head from side to side uttering deep low groans and murmuring now and then to himself words which miss anne could not understand she looked white and ill herself as if her strength were nearly exhausted but after the doctor had been in and feeling the master's pulse shook his head solemnly she would not consent to leave his bedside for any length of time how long she whispered going with the doctor to the outside of the door no more than twenty-four hours was the answer will he be conscious all the time she asked again i cannot tell certainly replied the doctor but most probably not only twenty-four hours one day of a swiftly passing time and then the eternal future one more sun setting and one more sun rising and then everlasting night or eternal day for a minute miss anne leaned against the doorway with a fainting spirit there was so much to do and so short a space for doing anything all the real business of the whole life had to be crowded into these few hours if possible as she entered the room her uncle's eyes met hers with a glance of unspeakable anguish and he called her in a trembling tone to her side i heard he whispered and what must be done now oh uncle she said have i not told you often that christ jesus came into the world to save sinners there is no limit with god with him one day is as a thousand years and he gives you still a day to make your peace with him there is no peace for my soul with god he answered i've been at enmity with him all my life and he will receive me at the last moment he is too just too righteous anne i'll not insult him by offering him my soul now you asked me once what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul mine is lost lost and that without remedy this gold is a millstone about my neck uncle she said commanding her voice with a great effort the thief upon the cross beside our lord had a shorter time than you for he was to die at sunset that day yet he repented and believed in the crucified saviour who was able to pardon him christ is still waiting to forgive he is stretching out his arms to receive you only look at him with the same penitence and faith that the dying thief felt nay groaned the dying man he could show his faith by confessing him before all those who were crucifying the lord and it was a glory to the saviour to forgive him then but what glory would it be to pardon me on this deathbed, where i can do nothing for him no i can do nothing nothing all these years i could have worked for god but now i can do nothing uncle said miss anne our lord was asked by some what shall we do that we might work the works of god and he answered them this is the work of god that ye believe on him whom he hath sent oh that is all believe on him and he will forgive you and all the angels in heaven will glorify him for his mercy and he answered fixing on her a look of despair i cannot my heart is hard and heavy i remember when i used to feel and care about these things but it is dead now and my soul is lost for ever 
and even if jesus is willing to pardon me i cannot believe in forgiveness miss anne sank down by the bedside unable to answer him save by a prayer half aloud to god for his mercy to be shown to him if it were possible he lay there helpless and hopeless tossing to and fro upon the pillows at last he spoke again in a sharp clear energetic tone and be quick he said find me my will among those papers perhaps if i could do something i might be able to believe he watched her with impatient eagerness as she turned over the precious parcel of papers which he had rescued from the fire there were many documents and writings belonging to the property he had gathered together and it was some time before she could find the will the master tried to take it from her but in vain his right hand was powerless oh i forgot he cried despairingly this hand is useless and i cannot alter it now god will not let me undo the mischief i have done anne i have left fern's hollow away from you to my brother thomas lest you should restore it to stephen and now i can do nothing oh misery misery the robbery and murder of the fatherless children rest upon my soul send quickly anne send for stephen fern miss anne sent a messenger to hasten stephen and after that the master lay perfectly still with closed eyes as if he were treasuring up some little strength remaining to him the last sunset was over and the night lamp was lighted once more while miss anne sat beside him watching in an agony of prayer to god there was no sound to be heard for every one in the house knew that the old man was dying and they kept a profound quietness throughout all the rooms he had taken no notice of anything since he asked for stephen but when a light rap was heard at the door he opened his eyes and turned his grey head round anxiously to see whether he had come it was stephen he stood within the doorway not liking to enter farther but looking straight forward at the master with a very pale and sorrowful face upon which there was no trace of triumph or hatred miss anne gazed earnestly at him but she did not speak she would not place herself between him and his dying enemy now come here stephen said the master in a voice of hopeless agony when little nan was lying dead you said you would wait and see what god could do to me come near and hear and see death is nothing boy it will only be a glory to you to die but god is letting loose his terrors upon me he is mocking at my soul and laughing at my calamity soon soon i shall be in eternity without hope and without god oh master master exclaimed stephen there is a time yet for our father to forgive thee it doesn't take long to forgive it didn't take even me long to forgive and oh how quickly god can do it if you'll only ask him do you forgive me asked the master in astonishment ah he cried i forgave thee long ago directly after i was ill it was god who helped me and wouldn't he rather forgive thee himself oh he loves thee he taught me how to love thee and could he do that if he didn't love thee his own self if i could only believe in being forgiven said the dying man oh believe it dear master see i am here i have forgiven thee and i do love thee little nan can never come back and yet i love thee and forgive thee from my very heart will not jesus much more forgive thee pray for me stephen kneel down there and pray aloud he said and his eyelids closed feebly and his restless head lay still as if he had no more power to move it i cannot answered stephen i'm only a poor lad and i don't know how to do it up loud miss anne will pray for thee if you have forgiven me pray to god for me murmured the master opening his eyes again with a look of deep entreaty over stephen's pale face a smile was kindling 
a smile of pure intense love and faith and the light in his pitying eyes met the master's dying gaze with a gleam of strengthening hope he clasped the cold hand in both his own and kneeling down beside him he prayed from his very soul lord lay not this sin to his charge he could say no more and miss anne who knelt by him was silent except for that one sob burst from her lips the master stirred no more but lay still with his numb and paralyzed hand in stephen's clasp but in a few minutes he uttered these words in a tone of mingled entreaty and assertion god be merciful to me a sinner that was all an hour or two afterwards it was known throughout longville and the news was on the way to botfield that the master of botfield works was dead End of chapter 22chapter twenty three of fern's hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fern's hollow by hesba stretton chapter twenty three the home restored three months later in the year when the new house at fern's hollow was quite finished with its dairy and coal shed and a stable put up at mr lockwood's desire a large party assembled within the walls martha had been diligently occupied all the week in a grand cleaning down and tim and stephen had been equally busy in clearing away the litter left by the builders and in restoring the garden to some order they had been obliged to contrive some temporary seats for their visitors for the old furniture had not yet been brought up from the cinder hill cabin and the only painful thoughts martha had were the misgivings of its extreme scantiness in their house with six rooms the pasture before the cottage was now securely enclosed and the wild ponies neighed over the hedge in vain at the sight of the cool clear pool where they had been used to quench their thirst and behind the house there was a plantation of tiny fir trees bending to and fro in the wind which they were to resist as they grew larger every place was in perfect order and the front room which was almost grand enough for a parlor was beautifully decorated with flowers in honor of the expected guests who had sent word that they should visit ferns hollow that afternoon they could be seen far away from the window of the upper story which rising above the brow of the hill behind commanded a wide view of the mountain plains they were coming on horseback across the almost pathless uplands near miss anne with mr lockwood riding beside her and a little way behind them the lord of the manor and his young wife who was no other than miss lockwood herself they greeted stephen and martha with many smiles and words of congratulation and when they were seated in the decorated room with the door and window opened upon the beautiful landscape mr lockwood bade them come and sit down with them while tim helped the groom to put up the horses in the stable my boy said mr lockwood our business is finished at last mr thomas wiley will not try his right to ferns hollow by law but we have agreed to give him the fifteen pounds paid to your grandfather and also to pay him all the actual cost of the work done here miss anne and i have had a quarrel on the subject but she consents that i shall pay that as a mark of my esteem for you and my old servant your mother mr danesford intends to make a gift to you of the pasture and plantation which were an encroachment upon the manor and now i want you to take my advice into the bargain jackson wants to come here and offers a rent of twenty pounds a year for the place will you let him have it till you're old enough to manage it properly yourself stephen yes if you please sir replied stephen in some perplexity for he and martha had quite concluded that they should come and live there again themselves 
jackson will make a tidy little farm of it for you continued mr lockwood my daughter proposes taking martha into her service and putting her into the way of learning dairy work and many other things of which she is now ignorant are you willing martha oh yes sir said martha with a look of admiration at young mrs danesford in this case stephen mr lockwood went on you will have a yearly income of twenty pounds and we would like to hear what you will do with it there's grandfather said stephen diffidently right my boy cried mr lockwood with a smile of satisfaction well miss anne thinks he would be very comfortable with mrs thompson and she would be glad of a little money with him but he cannot live much longer stephen he is very aged and the doctor thinks he will hardly get over the autumn so we had better settle what shall be done after grandfather is gone sir said stephen i think martha should have some good of grandmother's work if she is only a girl so hadn't the rent better be saved up for her till i'm old enough to come and manage the farm myself every face in the room glowed with approbation of stephen's suggestion and martha flushed crimson at the very thought of possessing so much money and visions of future greatness more than her grandmother had foreseen passed before her mind why martha will be quite an heiress said mr lockwood so she is provided for and grandfather and what do you intend to do with yourself stephen till you come back here i'm strong enough to go back to the pit replied stephen bravely though inwardly he shrank from it but how else could the rent of fern's hollow be laid by for martha now miss anne has raised the wages i should get eight shillings a week and more as i grow older i shall do for myself very nicely thank you sir and maybe i could lodge with grandfather at mrs thompson's no said miss anne in her gentle voice the sweetest voice in the world to stephen now that little nans was silent stephen is my dear friend and he must let me act the part of a friend towards him i wish to send him to live with a good man whom i know the manager of one of the great works at netley where he may learn everything that will be necessary to become my bailiff i shall want a true trustworthy agent to look after my interests here and in a few years stephen will be old enough to do this for me he shall attend a good school for a few hours daily to gain a fitting education and then what servant could i find more faithful more true and more loving than my dear friend stephen he can come back here then if he chooses and perhaps have martha for his housekeeper in their old home at fern's hollow oh miss anne cried stephen i cannot bear it may i really be your servant all my life and the boy's voice was lost in sobs come stephen said the lord of the manor i want you to show us some of your old haunts on the hills if miss anne had not formed a better plan i should have proposed making you my gamekeeper for jones had been telling me about the grouse last year by the way if i had thought it would be any pleasure to you i should have dismissed him from my service for his share in this business but i knew you would be for begging him in again so i only told him pretty strongly what a sneak i thought him they went out then across the uplands a sunny ramble to all stephen's favourite places and it happened that when they reached the solitary yew-tree near which snip was buried all the rest strolled on and left stephen and miss anne alone before them down at the foot of the mountains there stretched a wide plain many miles across beautiful with woods and streams and on the far horizon there hung a light cloud that was always to be seen there the index of those great works where stephen was to dwell for some years near to them they could discern in the clear atmosphere the spires and towers of the county town where black thompson who had tempted him on these hills was now imprisoned for many years and below though hidden from their sight was botfield and the cinder hill cabin a band of bilberry gatherers was coming down the hill with songs and shouts of laughter 
and the frightened flocks of sheep stood motionless on the hillocks ready to flee away in a moment at their approach both miss anne and stephen felt a crowd of thoughts sorrowful and happy come thronging to their minds stephen said miss anne solemnly our lord says when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you say we are unprofitable servants we have done that which was our duty to do yes miss anne said stephen looking up inquiringly into his teacher's face my dear boy she continued are you taking care to say to yourself i am an unprofitable servant i have not done all those things which are commanded me he said simply and earnestly i've done nothing of myself yet it's you that have taught me miss anne and god has helped me to learn i'm afeard partly of going away to netley but if you're not there to keep me right god is everywhere stephen miss anne said you have forgiven all your enemies tim who is now your friend and the gamekeeper black thompson and my poor uncle when you are saying the lord's prayer do you feel as if you should be satisfied for our father to forgive you your trespasses in the same measure and in the same manner as you have forgiven their trespasses against you oh no cried stephen in a tone of some alarm tell me why not it was a rather hard thing for me he said it was very hard at first and i had to be persuaded to it and every now and then i felt as if i'd take the forgiveness back i shouldn't like to feel as if our father found it a hard thing or repented of it afterwards no answered miss anne he is a god ready to pardon and when he has bestowed forgiveness his gifts and calling are without repentance but there is something more stephen do you not seem in your own mind to know them and remember them most by their unkindness and sins towards you when you think of black thompson is it not more as one who has been your enemy than one whom you love without any remembrance of his faults and you recollect my uncle as him who drove you away from your own home and was the cause of little nan's death their offences are forgiven fully but not forgotten can i forget murmured stephen no she replied but do you not see that we clothe our enemies with their faults against us should our father do so should we stand before him bearing in his sight all our sins would that forgiveness content us stephen oh no he cried again tell me miss anne what will he do for me besides forgiving me look stephen she replied pointing to the distant sky where the sun was going down amid purple clouds and bidding him to turn to the gray horizon where the sun had risen in the morning listen as far as the east is from the west so far hath he removed our transgressions from us and again he will turn again he will have compassion upon us he will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea and again for i will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will i remember no more this is the forgiveness of our father stephen oh how different to mine cried stephen hiding his face in his hands yet said miss anne you may claim the promise made to us by our lord if ye forgive men their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you in a far richer measure with infinite long-suffering and a multitude of tender mercies lord forgive me for jesus christ's sake murmured stephen but the dusk was gathering and the others were returning to them under the old yew tree for there was the long ride over the hill to danesford and the time for parting was come the day was done and on the morrow new work must be entered upon the path of the commandments had yet to be trodden step by step through temptation and conflict and weakness and weariness until the end was reached stephen felt something of this as he walked home for the last time to the cinder hill cabin 
and taking down the old bible covered with green baize read aloud to his grandfather and martha the chapter his father had taught him on his deathbed bending his head in deep and humble prayer after he had read the last verse be ye therefore perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect end of chapter 23 and end of ferns hollow by hesba stretton